There was once a, a priest who was able to follow the RCIA students into the church, and uh, it was a small parish, not like this parish with 25,000 parishioners that are registered. So he, was, he had the, the, lead, or the, uh, the honor to be able to do that. But this priest was being highly praised. Cardinal DiNardo was there to do the Mass when they were going to be uh, in initiated into the church. And so many of the, the students had told Cardinal DiNardo what a wonderful priest this was. And so Cardinal DiNardo at the Mass said, you know, we want to thank Father John. Appa you know, apparently you're so highly praised by the people here. And the priest said, oh, Cardinal, you've heard their confessions. You know they're liars. <laughs> Just to say that as a priest, we know a lot of things. <laughs> we know things that uh, we can't always speak, uh, speak about in public, and that's the case today also. I read all of your letters, each one more beautiful than the other, so I know what beautiful journeys you've made to come to this point. And when you look back, um, and see how God has intervened and put the right people in your path or made you feel the right things maybe during masses that you attended. Um, all of that was God. And so when you look back, you see the golden thread that was guiding you to this moment. And so what a wonderful, what a wonderful experience for me as a priest to be able to be part of that. Now today we celebrate Divine Mercy Sunday. This beautiful feast or this beautiful celebration was in, instituted by St. John Paul II on the canonization mass for Sister Faustina Kowalska, who was a, uh, a nun, uh, who God appeared to and revealed so many beautiful visions about his mercy. And um, St. John Paul II felt how, how important it was for Divine Mercy Sunday to fall on the second Sunday of Easter, where in some cases we speak about the, the story of the prodigal son, the son who takes his inheritance, squanders it, and then returns to the father. And instead of finding a judgmental father who reprimands him, finds a father eager to run to embrace him. But we also, on the second Sunday of Easter, celebrate the institution of the sacrament of reconciliation, the sacrament of confession. And this is a sacrament of mercy. And it's beautiful how it comes about in today's gospel, where Jesus, three days after the resurrection, appears to the apostles. And John's gospel tells us he breathes on, breathes on them and says, P, um, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain them, they are retained. This seems just like a, it's not a normal gesture that Jesus would do. In fact, if we look at the roots of what's going on, we go back to the Old Testament, and even from the Jewish point of view, God in creation breathes into the dust of the earth in order to give Adam the spirit of life, in order to make man out of the clay of the ground. So it's a life-giving act. This breathing is a life-giving act. It's an act of creation. So when Jesus breathes on the apostles present, he's inaugurating this new, in this new creation, this new sacrament by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now I'm sure many of you might have even heard someone say, or maybe you thought it yourself, why do I have to go to a priest to confess my sins when I can go directly to God? And indeed, you can. But the reason we do that is precisely today's gospel. Because uh, when Jesus gave the apostles this power to forgive sins or to retain them, those apostles laid their hands on their successors and passed on that power, and those successors laid their hands on their successors, and those successors on their successors, all the way to the present moment. And so 
this June, the first Saturday of June, when Cardinal DiNardo ordains three new priests for our diocese, he's passing on this power to forgive sins. Sacrament of Confession is the only time that we can be certain that our sins are forgiven because when the priest prays the prayer of absolution, um, he's basically saying your sins are forgiven. And so you have the certainty. He didn't say, no, I'm not going to do that right now. He could, <laughs> but he looks for contrition. Now, today we're, we want to enter into the mercy of God and there are some things about God's mercy. <clears throat> One is, why are some people not merciful? Why is it so hard for some people to be accepting of someone who made, might have made a mistake, uh, someone who's gone astray, or welcoming, welcoming them back after they've rejected the belief? I'd like to always refer to the story of the prodigal son, specifically the older son. So when the young son goes and squanders all his inheritance on loose living, loses all his money, goes hungry, takes a job feeding pigs, which in the Jewish culture is the worst possible thing you could do, that's when he realizes, I can go back to my father and ask him to accept me not as his son, but at least as one of his servants. So he prepares his lecture or his speech to his father, and as his father sees him coming, he runs to embrace him and puts a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, a cloak, and then throws a big party, if you remember. Then the son, who, the older son who is out working, is so upset that he refuses to go into the house. He's not merciful. So my point is, the older son needs to fall on his face a little more, needs to recognize or make decisions that show him that he's deviated from God. And then he can be open to the reality of who he is um, and be able to have mercy. If you've ever experienced suffering to such a great extent that, that it seems that uh, you're despairing and you unite your suffering to those of Jesus, when you're made to drink of the very chalice of God through suffering, through tragedy, through separation, uh, through illness, then God rewards the soul with a special kind of love. And that love is called mercy. And it's the kind of love that starts conversations with people like the Samaritan woman who had five husbands. It's the sort of confirmation, a sort of conversation that begins with people like Zacchaeus, the rich tax collector who, after Jesus came to his house, said, I'm going to give half of my uh, wealth to the poor. And so this is how God sometimes helps us to have mercy in our heart towards others. So there are two, two aspects of mercy. One is the mercy that we recognize that we need before God because even though we try to walk the journey that we know is Christ-like, we realize how many shortcomings we have, we have to start again and again and again, and that's what the sacrament of reconciliation helps us to do, to start again to walk on this journey. So among the letters that I read uh, uh, that, you, that you wrote, uh, one that struck me particularly uh, because uh, it's maybe such a typical experience of someone who um, is very intelligent, but eventually is able to discover the, the truth of faith. And I won't tell you who she is, even though she knows, um, but this is what she wrote to me. I coexisted with Christians, even befriended them, but I couldn't help feeling superior to them. It felt silly to believe something I could take apart with just a few questions. I lived this way for a long while until I finally met my match. Someone could answer my questions, who could outreason me. I asked those gotcha questions, and she got me right back. 
Of course, we became friends immediately. As her and I grew closer, tragedy struck me and I was unprepared. She tried to be supportive, but there was only so much she could do. So she asked me if I would like to come to adoration, adoration of the Blessed Sacrament with her. And for whatever reason, I said yes. We, watched, we, mar we walked into the chapel and kneeled. I looked up and I gazed upon the blessed host. I felt something like God was truly present and that he saw me. Despite everything, he saw me and he did not turn his head. My own head dropped in shame. My friend beside me prayed the rosary. At first, I tried to follow my eyes and throat clogged with tears and my hands too busy hiding my face. But to be frank, I caught, I caught none of the words at all. We cried, prayed, finished, and left. It was all kind of a blur, but I knew one thing. I needed to know more. My friend was more than happy to oblige. She gave me the UCAT, took me to mass with my family, with her family. It was very difficult and still is at times, but I truly feel something here. That's what I want, that's why I want to be Catholic. Y'all have the answers to hard questions. Y'all have God, or, well, God has y'all, I suppose. St. Anthony of Padua, pray for us.